Welcome to the Amphigory Effect podcast with your host, Zach Brackett, and your co-host, Justin Marlowe. Let's begin. I thought air conditioning, actually. Yeah? I remember one time, we, we were, it was really hot like this, and we were talking about getting an air conditioner, and I was like, hey, you guys, because they were talking about the one they had gotten, and the guy said it was like a two-ton unit or something. What does that mean? It doesn't weigh two tons. I'm like, actually, I know exactly what that is. <laughs> and he informed us. It was very nice. Yeah. And he funny. didn't do it uh, talking down to us at all. No, not that. Uh, <laughs> so he actually learned something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He yeah. actually learned yeah. something. Yeah, from Justin, no less. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. It's a new trick. Yeah. The school's great, guys. Yeah, it's great. Uh, welcome to the Infigure Effect Podcast. Uh, we're sitting here today in this a million degree shop, having a blast, talking to people. Justin, who we talked to today? Today we're talking to Mr. Fritz, a retired mechanical engineer. Ooh, that sounds fun, man. So uh, let's just jump right into it. Man. Yeah, let's go. Tell us a little bit, first of all, where you worked as an engineer and maybe why you got into engineering starting out. Okay, I guess uh, my education background, I uh, went to the Merchant Marine Academy and uh, while I was there, they had a nuclear program, so I was interested in nuclear engineering, so I took that and got a minor in nuclear. Got out of school and started working in a shipyard on nuclear submarines. Uh, wow. Makes sense that uh, that, those are, that this was back in the 70s, so you had, uh, those are the folks that uh, operated reactors more than anybody else, so I got some experience there. And then uh, did several years of that, and then uh, the only other folks that operate reactors besides the Navy was utilities, so I interviewed around, ended it up here in the Carolinas working for Duke Power as an engineer. Okay, uh, how long, wh- when did you, uh, you retired now? Yes, I'm retired now. I've put in 38 years at uh, Duke. Wow. Well, yeah, I've heard that's a pretty good place to work. Most people who go there end up staying there. Yeah, so I started out in uh, design on the stations and then went to the operation side of it. Wow. <clears throat> now, so tell me on the basic, most basic level, <laughs> okay, um, give me a rundown of like, a, what, what is a nuclear reactor actually doing? It's heating water. <clears throat> that's it? And that's making it. steam, and right? And making steam? That's right. Okay, that's that's that doesn't seem too, too complicated. So perfectly <laughs> right, yeah, it sounds well, instead like Instead of burning coal or burning oil, you're burning uranium. So that's a, mm-hmm. it's a cleaner form of energy, right? In a sense? It's a, it's that's not, kind of a complicated it's not, question, right? Yeah, it's not uh, generating any gases that go to the atmosphere like you do with uh, coal or oil. Okay. So it's clean from that aspect. Right. Um, it does have waste that you have to deal with, which uh, you have it waste with any kind of, a, I guess like coal, you have coal ash. And, yeah. Fly ash mm-hmm. that goes out into the environment, so you do have, uh, but you have waste, but you have a lot less of it than you have to deal with. What, what are they doing with the, with the waste? Like what? Currently, it's uh, stored in fuel pools around the country. Basically, they take the fuel out of the reactor and stick it in a pool to keep it cool because it still has some residual heat, and uh, eventually they'll hopefully separate it out and uh, dispose of it. Okay. Right now it's a political problem is what it is. Oh, okay. The technology has been around to deal with this stuff since the 70s, but it's been a political hot potato and that's what's... So it's not required for for a, for a plant to, to dispose of it in that way? They have some kind of choice over how they... The uh, utilities do not actually own the fuel. Uh, a private entity cannot own fissile material. Oh, okay. So it's actually kind of uh, the government has given it to the utility to use, but the government still technically owns it. So it's their choice what to do with it? Right. Okay, interesting. Mm-hmm. I had no idea. Mm-hmm. And, uh, now, one, one thing I have heard you mention before is that it's not all reactors work exactly the same way, and there's a difference between like a, a closed system and an, an open system. Could you talk about that a little bit? Like, uh, I remember you saying that uh, the Fukushima plant, for example, um, actually heats the same water that is turned right. into steam yeah, you directly. You have two basic uh, uh, what reactor designs that are in use in the United States today. We have a, a boiling water reactor which actually boils in the reactor core. The water boils to steam and that steam in turn drives your turbines which generates electricity. And then you have a pressurized water reactor in which you've got a um, the, pr- the reactor actually heats the water but it stays liquid and you, it's under higher pressure and then that water is used to heat a secondary loop, which actually turns into steam and drives your turbines. So the uh, pressurized water reactor, you have clean steam, if you want to look at it that way. It's not radioactive, actually driving your turbines, where in a boiling water reactor, 
the steam actually is radioactive that drives your turbine. So mm -hmm. what kind of threat does radioactive steam pose? Is that a danger or a hazard? Uh, <laughs> no, because you're talking about uh, radioactive isotopes of uh, uh, oxygen, which uh, decay in about seven or eight seconds. Oh, okay, so they're, yeah. they're not actually harmful. Right. Okay. Well, that's mm -hmm. nice. Yeah, good to know. Isn't yeah, it? good to know. <laughs> Yeah, the problem comes in, you may have some particulates that get stuck into the secondary side, and what happens then is that you've got a radioactive turbine that you have to do maintenance on, which is not a major problem, it just means you have to take extra precautions. Okay. <clears throat> so, I mean, as far as actual safety concerns then, if, if this uh, radiated steam isn't a problem, what are some of the risks involved with nuclear power? The uh, biggest risk, of course, is the what to do with the used fuel. Um, currently, we're storing it and trying to wait for the government to decide what to ultimately to do with it. Um, you do have uh, radiation hazards inside the plant. You don't have any radiation outside the plant. The plant has done a very good job at containing that. And yeah, that's something it. that's contained, right? Right. Okay. It's, it's very heavily shielded, and the workers are trained to work on um, material, I'm mean, working with that material and stay, keep them and prevent themselves from being contaminated basically. So you've got a very rigorous program to make sure that the workers don't get contaminated and that no contamination gets outside the station. Can you talk a little bit about meltdown? I think that's a, a word you hear a lot. Yeah, that's what I think of when I hear it. Yeah, okay. but I don't think it's, I personally don't really know what that is and I think a lot of our viewers probably are unclear on yeah, what exactly a nuclear meltdown is. Could you talk about that? That's uh, basically the uh, a reactor, when you turn it on, you really can't turn it off. Hmm. So it's producing heat all the time. Even when you shut the reactor down, uh, there is still a amount of residual heat that's being generated by um, the decay products inside the core there. You have uh, fission isotopes that continue to uh, produce heat. And you've got to get rid of that heat, basically. If you don't, that's going to heat up and eventually melt, which is where your meltdown comes from. Now, hmm. when you say meltdown, does that refer to that that fissile material, or is that like the containment shielding melting, or what exactly does that mean? It's, it's actually the material that's in the fuel itself. So the fuel is in pins, and it's you have the fissile material there, which is the uranium, along with the fission products with it, and uh, they uh, it's all together in there, and it continues to heat up, and uh, it's going to melt the interior of the, uh, or the, the cladding material that's holding the fuel together, and it's going to drop into the bottom of the reactor vessel there. So, so it's, still, it's still all contained within the reactor vessel and still contained within the reactor building itself. Okay. Yeah, so I was about to ask, so like places, the big places like Chernobyl or something like that, mm -hmm. it, what happened there? Is that a type of meltdown that just got out of hand or is it completely different? Or Yeah, Chernobyl is a, a good bit different. It was a different style reactor. It oh, was, okay. uh, and it really did not have a containment like we have in this country. I see. So what happened is that uh, the reactor had an extreme power excursion which caused a steam explosion which blew the uh, core basically over the countryside because oh, the, the containment wow. really wow, the containment yeah. really wasn't designed to be able to handle that. Yeah, that's not good. Right. Not good Sounds enough. like some bad engineering to me. <laughs> well, what it was, it was, a, it was a, an expedient method to build a reactor mm. and the Russians did not, uh, this was actually during the Soviet era, they did not uh, put as much emphasis on safety as we do in this country. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. Mm. And that, that was part of the result of that is that they had a pretty bad mess. Uh, looking at uh, the uh, Fukushima reactor, you actually did have meltdown occur there, and uh, two of the three, actually three reactors did melt, two of the three, everything was contained within their containment, uh, the second reactor actually did have a breach of their containment, so they had radioactive material actually leaking out of the containment, so that was because the actual containment had failed there. Mm -hmm. Wow, and so that's just it not being able to withstand whatever forces are or the I don't, temperature? Yeah, I'm not exactly sure if they know exactly what portion of it failed, but uh, basically they did have a breach of that containment so that you got bad stuff out into the environment. So, and, okay, go ahead. So is, is the, you said the reactor, when it gets turned off, they need to make sure that that heat goes out, right? So is the reactor running constantly or are they turning it off at certain times for maintenance or how does that? The reactor is shut down routinely for maintenance about once a year, every year and a half or two years okay, depending so, on the design. So it's not like every night they're going and flipping the switch and turning right. it off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And how uh, long does it take for it to spin down? I mean, because this, 
I'm assuming you're you're cutting off a fuel, and yet there's still a chain reaction happening before it just runs out and stops. Is that kind of yeah, how it the happens? The residual heat continues on for quite some time. Actually, it's going to continue on for uh, months, but it goes mm -hmm. on to such a low enough level that you can take care of it with uh, basically a, a small amount of cooling to it. But uh, right after shutdown, probably an hour or two before it, a lot most of your visions go to die away. Really? Okay. Wow. I didn't think it would be that fast. No, I didn't think so either. Uh, do you want to get kind of political here then? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So we're talking about energy. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you have to, right? Yeah, so... I That's mean, something I actually wanted to briefly mention is how often... You already mentioned that how the fuel, the used fuel is stored is a completely political issue and not anything that like an engineer like yourself would have any control over. Are there other ways that policy or politics kind of interfere with... Mm -hmm like a plant's ability to do its job? I wouldn't say that poli well, politics actually gets involved with um, the operation of a station. That uh, Politics does get involved with the financial side as far as mm. public opinion, deciding whether or not we want to invest in this kind of technology or not. And that's currently where nuclear power is kind of at, is that um, there's not a lot of public support to continue to build these, so who's going to invest in it? So that becomes an economic issue then. So in the meantime, we're looking for other places to invest to get our power from. Does that lead? Into yeah, your that's what I was going to ask. I was going to ask if um, if you felt like this was the best way to get energy. If there are other methods, because I don't really know much. I know there's a big uh, hubbub about clean energy and not polluting the environment, and I know that uh, there's been a lot of uh, uprising against coal. Um, but I don't know much about the nuclear side of it. So do you think that uh, it's a valid form of getting your energy, as in the long run for the Earth, or do you think that we should try to find these other ways? And it's kind of, a, I guess, uh, got a lot of pieces to it. Yeah, it does. Question, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I guess. Yeah. I initially uh, hitched my car to nuclear power because uh, I thought it was a clean way of producing energy and it wasn't uh, burning hydrocarbons and sending mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff into the atmosphere and uh, having to deal with coal ash, coal ash and some of the stations around the country have had issues with that. Um, but the point is, is that I thought it was a, a good way of producing energy and it would kind of bridge the gap until we were able to get a fusion reactors working. A fusion reactor is going to have uh, basically no uh, residual waste to have to get rid of like you have with a fission type reactor. Okay. And when I graduated from college, we were thinking that, okay, fission, fusion would be on the horizon maybe 30 years down the road. And uh, that hasn't happened. <laughs> And I think that's primarily because the research hasn't gone into it that we needed to. <laughs> the Europeans actually have some, uh, have been doing more research on that than we have in this country. But uh, e even at that, they're not able to uh, get a sustaining reactor working yet. Well, but that's that's kind of what I envision nuclear power would be as kind of a uh, something to bridge the gap between coal and then when we actually got fusion power working. Okay, that oh, makes that's sense. interesting. So you, you don't have any illusions about it not being a perfect system? Nothing is perfect, I guess. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's 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 got its faults. If you look at any kind of energy production, there's pros and cons to it. Uh, and even with fusion, there probably would be some things that we haven't figured oh, out. Oh yeah, I'm yet. sure. Yeah. But uh, it does have the potential to be a lot cleaner than uh, fission fission power. <clears throat> Interesting. That makes sense. That makes sense. So in a world where, say, another 50 years down the line, we still haven't solved fusion. Where do you think nuclear energy fits into like a, a global plan for meeting the energy needs of the world? Do you think that maybe it might be replaced by some other kind of stopgap technology, or do you think that it's going to be important until we get to that, that next point? Um, I think it should be, uh, well, it can be used. It's a proven technology like coal, like oil. Uh, wind and solar are, becoming, are coming online now, but the issues with that is that uh, the sun doesn't shine all the time and the wind doesn't always blow, so yeah. you're going to have to have some kind of backup system to be able to supply power when it's dark out and when the wind's not blowing. Yeah, sure. So, uh, how, yeah. how do those kind of systems, especially wind and solar, I hear a lot of people talking about that, like Zach was saying with the, this whole push for green renewable energy sources, how efficient are they? I've heard things, especially about solar, that in order for it to get above like 40%, the the panels need to actually track the sun mm -hmm. as it moves across the sky, and that on its own takes power. Mm -hmm. so, so you're using some of your power. And then I even heard things like uh, governments giving credits to 
to like companies with the like especially larger buildings like your Walmarts and things will have flat roofs they can put solar panels on there but a lot of times they have to do some sort of renovations in order to support all the weight of those panels so when you factor in all this all the those cost little worth, yeah. niggling costs yeah how does how does something like solar or wind stack up versus more traditional methods of getting power I think the the jury on a lot of that is still out because um, there's a lot of cost involved in those that we really haven't gotten our arms around with. Mm -hmm. Maintenance cost is being probably the big one, is that how long do these things effectively run before oh, we I didn't have think to replace them? Yeah, I mean, yeah. And we haven't run long enough with this to really figure that out. Um, so there's a lot of unanswered questions there. Um, yeah, wind has also got some drawbacks. I guess Europe has gone very heavily into wind. They're using wind to basically replace their nuclear stations there because they're wow. going with the, the clean energy piece. And uh, although uh, they're seeing event or effects of changes in local weather because of the wind farms that they create. Really? So uh, you have a wind farm that's uh, several, I mean, hundreds of, maybe not hundreds, but well, it could be a, maybe 100 acres. And uh, it's taking energy out of the air there. And that's creating mm -hmm. a higher pressure zone there, which is causing weather to move around that wind farm, either north or south of it, which is causing temperature changes around there. It's only a few degrees, right. but still, wow. it's, it's I never even thought of that. <laughs> yeah, that's well, insane. It's, it's, uh, I guess from an engineering standpoint, there is no free lunch. Yeah, you know, yeah. You true, take energy true. out of something, it's got to have gotta, an effect someplace. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And then the solar, I guess, also with the uh, amount of space that you have to take up. Mm -hmm. What about the, uh, or the environment underneath that? That's basically being deprived of sunlight. True. So that's a negative aspect there. So it, again, you've got pop pluses and minuses there. You, gotta, you have to weigh it all together. And, and right now, uh, wind and solar is being heavily subsidized, so it's very economically attractive because the government's picking up the tab on that. Yeah, <laughs> you can tell yeah. definitely just by the amount of media it gets as well. Mm -hmm. Like uh, yeah. the every commercial for anything green, you'll see the the solar panels and all that and, and, it, and it's attractive because you know you want to obviously help the earth and you know not, not destroy the world but then when you stop and think about it and I didn't even think about the changes it makes to the climate directly around it you know you gotta you gotta factor in cost and and uh, are you hurting what's around you and that changing the weather even by a little bit around those wind farms that's that's crazy to me yeah I, I've heard they're super loud too like nobody wants to live nearby yeah, them there's a nice, so loud. They're, they're, they're hard on uh, uh, bird birds in particular oh mm -hmm. yeah I bet they just yeah, chopped yeah. up yeah, yeah. yeah. Oof, I guess uh, California the, the term they use they call them um, condor Cuisinarts <laughs> <laughs> oh man before we wrap things up, Mr. Fritz, I want to ask one last question. Um, you talked earlier about fusion and uh, how that might be a, a really nice possible solution in the future. I was wondering if there are any other kind of under the radar technologies that you know of that might be something to look into. I know you said you wanted fusion to be funded more. There, uh, if you were going to spend the government's energy budget, where would you put the dollars? Ooh. That's a good question. That's a good question, I guess. Uh, I, I'm partial to fusion because uh, it has the potential of producing large volumes of energy, electrical energy, which is what we're, we're needing. Um, there is a fair amount of effort going on into uh, tidal power. Uh, hydropower is very clean, although I think we pretty much maxed out our potential for hydropower around the country. Every river and uh, lake we could, we've got, we pretty much have dammed, yeah. dammed up to be able to use. So um, any further use of that's probably going to have some negative effects on the environment. In fact, what we got may have some effects there. But uh, tidal power, I'm not exactly sure how expensive that is, but that's basically where you're taking the energy of the tide flowing in and flowing out to uh, generate power. And there's some work going on in that area, but I'm not sure how widespread that could be. So again, it'd be a supplemental source of power like wind and um, solar. The other piece that needs to be done to make wind and solar really effective is to increase the battery technology to be able to store the energy right. that they make. Mm -hmm. That would also help with like mm -hmm. motor vehicle emissions and such as well, right? If, if electric cars were more efficient. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because you know, that's, that's a very large source of uh, pollution is uh, the internal combustion engine. So mm -hmm. if you cut back on that and use electric propulsion or hybrid propulsion, 
which still produces some uh, uh, pollution, but not as much as you do with a regular internal combustion engine, diesel or gas engine. <clears throat> and what do you think about uh, <clears throat> geothermal? That has, uh, geothermal has uh, potential, but there's very limited places in where that's uh, practical. Uh, places in, uh, in California, Utah, uh, I think Wyoming has some sites there where they can use that, so that is, um, a, that does have some application, but again, it's going to be limited. Okay. And there actually is drawbacks with that because a lot of times the uh, steam that comes out of those geothermal plants is very radioactive. Oh, so, really? Uh, okay. It's naturally, natural, naturally occurring radioactivity, but it's still something that you have to deal with. Hmm. Wow. Well, that was really interesting. I'm kind of blown away by how much I haven't really thought about it. I thought I was, you know, kind of up to date with energy stuff, but uh, that's that's really cool. Thank you so much, Mr. First, for coming out and talking with us. Had a great time talking yeah, to you. Yeah, really appreciate it. Sorry, it was so hot. Yeah, yeah, we'll <laughs> get it. We'll get it. Going on in here. Maybe maybe by like a, a, a year or so, and we'll have it done. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> by next summer, that's the goal. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with us. Please uh, remember to check out the Aftercast on Sunday and uh, hit that subscribe button. We only need like two or three more to get 50 and we'll plastic dip my car. It's going to be fun. So please remember to like, comment, subscribe on this video. Thank you so much. It'll be 100 degrees outside. We'll be best to get that car. Shut up. Bye. <laughs> bye.